I'm not just writing history. I am making it. I have the brain of a historian and the clapback of a comedian. You better come with sources because I always check footnotes. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Historians on Housewives. You're here with me, Casey. Me, Dr. J. Mill, the millionaires. Max Spear. What can I say? My pants are from Target. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, today we have a really great episode with Dr. Rachel Silverman, all about reproduction and fertility, fertility, queer Jewish identity and reality television, television more broadly. We're going to talk about all sorts of topics that'll probably be very, very resonant, especially for our female listeners. Indeed. One of the things we talk about is um, the ability to have children or the ability not to have children. And as academics, particularly academic women, we are often um, told to delay pregnancy until after the dissertation, or if you go on the job market and you look pregnant, it could be a deterrent to people who are hiring you. And then as a result, people wait till later in life to have children, and they either by that time cannot have children or it's a high-risk pregnancy. So this should resonate with our listeners on a lot of levels. Yeah, and being a pregnant woman right now, I you know, want to give a major shout-out to Jessica and actually the other female advisors I, I have here at UC are fine because I've found so much support for this pregnancy and, and the decision Max and I are making in a way that I know so many colleagues of mine at other institutions have not found. And so I, I just want to give you and the other really influential women in my life here that big nod. Well, I think, I think, thank you, thank you. I think the reality is, um, for some of us, like myself, I made certain decisions, and having a child is very hard at any level. And so it's better that you do it while you're younger in the early stages of the profession, um, because when you're doing your dissertation, you have the most free time that you'll ever have. I've been very pleased at the response um, that the department has had to to the fact that two of our PhD students, right, are now having a child and it might delay their progress and, and, and no one feels that way. It's been really a great celebration. So we are all looking forward to the little bundle arriving. And, and I really do hope, thank you, that um, more programs and more institutional spaces will start to look more like what we're experiencing right now here. Um, and as we'll talk about with, Dr. Rachel Silverman, that will hopefully also see much more patient-focused women's health care, um, which is going to be a great conversation. So Rachel E. Silverman is an associate professor of communication at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. She dreams that one day her collection of essays about the Real Housewives will make its way to the Clubhouse bookshelf. Now, this is a great edited volume on the housewives that she um, did in 2015. It's called The Fantasy of Reality, Critical Essays on the Real Housewives. It's fantastic. It does belong on the clubhouse bookshelf. Um, her research is twofold. The first part explores the intersection of queer and Jewish identity in popular culture and real life. The second part focuses on women's health practices, particularly well women's exams and infertility fertility. Both have a social justice imperative and look to make real life changes in the classroom and in practice. Some of her publications are pedagogical, each discussing critical thinking, engaged learning, and activism. She also teaches courses on travel communication and food studies, um, which she's published on, but aren't topic like main focus topics for her. So with that, let's welcome Rachel E. Silverman to the show. Thank you for having me. Would you like to share your Real Housewives tagline with the audience? Sure. 
Sure. My tagline is, I might be wrong, but I seriously doubt it. <laughs> That's great. That's I really like that. good. <laughs> Apparently, I said that once, and my wife thought it was hysterical and put it on the mug for me. That's pretty funny. Now I have a mug that also says it. That makes you our very first <laughs> guest that has their tagline on a mug. <laughs> Which I, I find very impressive. I feel like all of the Bravo Demics really need their taglines on a mug. I think I think so. That would be great merchandise. Mug, t-shirts. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so how did your interest in reality television come about? Uh, you know, I started watching reality TV probably with the second season of The Real World. And I just loved it. And, I, you know, I probably grew out of the real world at some point. Um, I was a big fan of Laguna Beach and the Hills and moved on to those shows. And then the Gastineau Girls. I had to look up that name and think about it when I was thinking about shows that I loved. Um, I was just talking to a friend. I loved The Girls Next Door, The Simple Life. Oh, I loved The Girls Next Door. <laughs> I loved it. And we were just reminiscing, I wonder what happened to them. Oh, yeah, Kendra got that show, and Holly moved to Vegas. Um, you know, I watched The Kardashians on and off for years, and The Housewives just came naturally. And as soon as, I don't, I don't think I watched the first season, but once I discovered them, I've watched them all. I watched Vanderpump Rules, some of the other spinoffs, um, and then, you know, now with Bravo, they just have so many wonderful shows to choose from. Do you have a favorite show right now? <clears throat> Right now, I'm watching a lot of Housewives with Dallas just ending and Atlanta being on and the OC just ending. Those three shows were consuming a lot of the past couple weeks and months. Um, I can't believe Vanderpump think- Rules is moving to a Tuesday. I know. It's going to really throw right. off the whole television viewing schedule for the week. It's, I'm always going to be confused about what day it is now. I know. Well, you know, I probably watch all of it on demand that I don't really think much about the night. Although I was disappointed when Housewives of Dallas reunion was not on this Sunday. So I guess they're skipping a week. But I'm, I'm invested in this season of Dallas. Yeah, Dallas was really holding it down for like yeah. fall semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really was. I was also a little like, Bravo, you're doing us a little dirty by not taking the typical holiday break. Like I can't keep up with everything. I'm usually Agreed. used to Vanderpump rules around Christmas time. So I felt like I was being denied. Like, you know, like, like it's like having eggnog at Starbucks. Like, I want Jax right. under the mistletoe. I don't want to kiss Jax in any way. <laughs> it sounded better in my head. I mean, that's fine. We're all about being free and open here. It is probably something you want to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> With, I don't know, Casey. <laughs> she should know something, yeah. Um, who are your top three Bravo celebrities? This was very hard for me to pick. Uh, And I realized as I was picking them, I had a theme. So my first one is Erica Girardi. I just love what she's added to Beverly Hills. Um, And then I also love Sonia Morgan. And I stuck with All Housewives because that's really where my heart is. And my third one was Deandra Simmons. And I realized what I like about these women is that in some way they all either come from money, married into money, but you know, there's still that side of these reality shows, you know, even when I was thinking about what got me into it, of like this voyeurism of this wealth. And I feel like Erica, Sonia, and Deandra give me access to that. Um, Whether it's sort of, and Morgan's old money and Deandra always fighting with her mom about their money and, you know, whatever, Dallas society. 
and then Erica just marrying into a ton of money, but keeping her pretty country roots. Um, I, I just, yeah, those are my favorites. I think at least right now they are. I think it's an interesting juxtaposition because at least Deandra and Sonia who married into a lot of money have also now faced or are still facing major money issues where they're almost right. not really sure even how to sustain their lifestyles without having that cash flow. Whereas right. Erica, on the other hand, really started very broke, very poor um, mm -hmm. waitressing, right? She met Tom mm -hmm. Girardi yeah. waitressing. So it's, she's almost like the inverse of their stories. Right. I mean, I think it's this, it, the relationship they have with money is fascinating to me. You know, I think about somebody like Lisa and Ken, like they worked hard and they made a lot of money and that's great. That's not super interesting, right? It's the people who came from and lost it or married into, I, I find that storyline much more interesting. Yeah, there's definitely, like, change over time. Whereas, like, with mm -hmm. Lisa and Ken, it's just sort of like they were born rich, they stayed rich, they're going to die rich. Right. Well, and someone like Vicky, who mm -hmm. has amassed her fortune through the course of the show, she has definitely gotten much more intense with each season mm -hmm. because of her money. More classist, do you mean? or? Well, I think... Um, her in, her intensity, like almost like the craziness that comes out of Vicky about protecting her money, mm -hmm. you know. And if you look at her Twitter, it's like almost exclusively about protecting your retirement mm -hmm. and like you know cutting off your children and like uh, how to get richer faster. Like you know, it's just she's so focused on her bottom line. She's a new rich because old yeah. lady doesn't have to worry about this. Right. And she's like using, she uses her social media as a platform to almost be like, and see, I did it. Then like tips for people to follow me, but <clears throat> in a very kind of possessive way about the way that she built herself. Whereas like mm -hmm. when she started, it was like, I need to show wealth. I need right. to like, cause Kodo insurance is coming up. Mm -hmm. It's a business, so it becomes like I can't be seen in this family van. Like we need like a bus to carry six people <laughs> to the airport. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. It's 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 super fascinating to watch various housewives' relationships to money. Yeah, but I think, like Jessica said, it's sort of the old money mm -hmm. that fascinates me. And I don't know if Girardi's husband is really old money, or he just made a lot, but feels like old money the ornateness and, feels like it's old money right you know ken and lisa or even kyle i mean they they're obviously wealthy but it doesn't feel like old money you know they, they spend a lot of time just talking about their careers and making more money so can i and obviously deandra and sonia are broke so they spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about it <laughs> well sonia's clothing line has finally come out so she actually has product now and the toaster oh, not the toast the toaster will never appear anymore no toaster okay. the clothing line with the crest on the shoes i believe that there are maybe some items with crest but she has dresses and outfits and people oh. wear her now and you can actually order online go on Sonia. okay so you know she might have more money soon right so I have a question. It might be kind of mm -hmm. a lighthearted question before we go on to more serious conversations. Sure. So you have seen Erica Jane perform in real life. I have. Tell us, <laughs> if you don't mind. She, Tell us. No, of course. She came to Orlando four or five years ago for Pride. And she performed at Parliament House, which is a big older i mean it's a big club but it's outdoors because it's sort of an older hotel and she was amazing and it was everything i could dream of and more and i you know it was still early on maybe it's been six years ago because she came back to orlando a year or two ago and tickets were you know something like 75 dollars whereas when i went and saw her i think it was 
12 or 15, um, which she was great. That's great. And yeah, it was very fun. I've seen her. I saw Jill Zarin once come and she was at the university where I was doing my PhD. And I saw was Alex she, McCoy. What was she doing? She was giving there? a lecture about women and media and entrepreneurship. And I also saw the McCords, right? Alex and Simon. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. I'm they so wrote, jealous. Yeah. Tell us. <laughs> that was, was it- years ago when they were doing a book tour, like their How to Raise Children book. I think that's uh-huh. what it was. With Francois and uh, oh my right. God. and John, like it's like Francois and something, Johan, something else, Johan. Yep, that was it. And all I see right now is Alex storming off, and I hear the click clack of the shoes. That's all I <laughs> hear in my mind. In like a really ridiculous outfit. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so let me get a little bit more serious, Rachel. So okay. we're really happy to have you here because because of the diversity of topics that you can um, speak on. And in some ways, you are going to kind of help, help us shift to what we like to do every once in a while, actually really serious uh, subject matter. Um, you okay. know, because scholars do Bravo too, but um bum so your research oh wait let me do it again but um, <laughs> so your research focuses on the intersection of queer and jewish identity in popular culture and real life women's health practices so how have you found resonance with your research on bravo or other reality television shows particularly if it you know relates to well women's exams or infertility can you talk to us a little bit about some of the things you found absolutely uh so the two topics are a little different for me. Um, You know, back when I was doing my dissertation, I was really looking at Jewish women on television. And I started noticing that a lot of times when Jewish women featured, like had predominant roles, they were in queer texts or there was, you know, Will and Grace came to mind, the show Queer Spoke. And I started knowing this connection between Jews, and the LGBTQ community in television. And, you know, there's lots of stereotypical stuff about, like, controlling media and Hollywood and Broadway and all that stuff. But it really, there's a really fascinating history between the two groups about their ability to go unseen, these invisible identities, model minorities, um, non-normative gender performances. So that has been a longstanding interest of mine. And, you know, with Bravo, I feel like when the Housewives started, you had more of this, you know, OC was your blonde Californians and Jersey was your, you know, Italians and Miami was kind of Hispanic and, um, or Latina and, New York had a Jewish vibe. And so I was fascinated always by those sort of cultural identity locations of the shows. And it's changed over the years. Um, But I'm still always curious to see how Jewish and queer identities pop up in television. And there have been a number of Jewish housewives over the years. Um, Some talk more about it than others. Um, There have been no lesbian housewives. We've seen, there was like a lesbian personal trainer years ago, and there's definitely a lot of gay best friends. Um, But I think there is this sort of queer aesthetic, or one of the things that I think is fascinating is Andy Cohen, who produces a lot of these shows and runs, even if he doesn't, to me, he runs Bravo. I mean, he's gay and he's Jewish. And I think what makes a lot of these shows really successful is the campiness about them. And Susan Sontag, who really came up with the ideas about camp, really talks a lot about how it is this combination of a queer and Jewish aesthetic, sort of these outsiders who fit in. Um and can pass and go unseen, but there's a sort of an ability to speak two languages, um, to recognize each other as in-group members. 
but also being part of the mainstream. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm, I think I'm drawn to these shows is the campiness. And, and in my book, one of the chapters that I really liked talks about how the reframing of these shows and the female friendship is sort of a queer relationship, right? These shows focus on women's friendships. They're not about their husbands or their dating lives. And those topics come in, but ultimately it's about female friendships. Um, so I think that's where I see a lot of my research about queer and Jewish identity. Um, coming through there I'm trying to think of you know I'm endlessly intrigued by the way the Jewish women are portrayed on these shows so I've been a little bothered recently with Real Housewives of New Jersey um, with Jackie this season Dolores has made a couple comments about how she was raised differently and has different values than them. And she's, you know, the one Jewish woman on the show. Um, and then, so that's been a little bothersome to me to see that sort of language happening and for it to go unchecked. Um, and then, you know, Jackie plays up her Jewishness at times and downplays it at other times. So, you know, there was recently an Easter episode and it was all about these big Easter celebrations and they asked her about Passover and she just was like, oh yeah, we didn't really do anything. Um, but then later, I think it was the next episode with the hair pulling at the shopping day where they were talking about oral sex and Jackie makes a joke about how Jewish girls don't give low jobs and, um, which is sort of this long-standing joke for about like the Jewish American princess. So it's those moments of sort of being outed as Jewish or being marked as Jewish because otherwise Jewishness goes unseen and becomes invisible. Um, so I'm always curious, like I said, to watch the different characters and how they talk about Jewishness or perform Jewishness or enact it. And then when they don't, and how it almost becomes invisible on the text. How did you um, transition into researching women's health practices? So that uh, <laughs> is sort of a funny story. So I, this was all my dissertation research and really where I focused my research in popular culture and media. While I was in grad school working my PhD, you know, I was broke and our communication department had a performance studies program and the medical school tapped into the performance studies program, asking us if we could come over and be standardized patients and perform different patient scenarios. And it was a great way for us to make some extra money working on campus. And then that translated <laughs> into me working as a standardized patient, which then um, I soon found out that if I was willing to go beyond just pretending to be sick, but also willing to get practice ob guy exams, I could make a lot more money. And so I did that for years um, in working on my PhD. And after having done it for about two years, I approached the woman who was in charge of the standardized patient program. And I said to her, you know, this could be a much better program. If we took the women on the table and gave them agency and voice, they could teach people, they could teach the medical students how to give these exams much more thoroughly than just laying there and letting the exams being performed on them. And she agreed because these, these programs exist nationwide. I wasn't coming up with anything new. It just didn't exist at USF. So I developed a gynecological teaching associate program and trained a whole bunch of women in communication practices. I partnered with a nurse. She's 
she did all the medical side. I did the communication side. And for years now have been training more GTAs how to be practice patients. So they know how to do the exam. They know how to receive the exam. And they know how to give feedback to the medical students, the nursing students. We also work with VA doctors who need to be retrained in gynecological exams. So long story short, in a need for some extra money in grad school, I was, as my father would say, selling my body, but in the best way possible. And that got me interested in women's health practices because women's health is generally underfunded and not well researched and, um, so I moved into that, and then over the past couple of years, my partner and I have been trying to get pregnant, and so I moved into fertility stuff and have been exploring that research as well, because it's still very much in line with women's health and women's exams, and so that's how I got into that topic. Um just a quick follow-up question. Um, mm-hmm. I'm interested to know um, how does woman or patient-centered gynecological exams look like? What does that look like? Can you provide an example of that? Sure. So prior to having a voice, we would just lay there and the doctor would come in and be like, here's how you do the exam. And we didn't say anything. Um, now, you know, it will be two trained GTAs and usually one medical provider, a nursing student, a medical student, whatever. And they come in and really from the beginning, we introduce ourselves, we explain to them who we are, how we've been trained, what we're there to do. Then usually we break into a little bit of role play where the medical student, you know, asks about your health, um, history, which, you know, we work with them on the framing of those questions, questions like, you know, are you sexually active? Yes. And they'll say, how many people are you sleeping with? And we say, okay, maybe you should reframe this to, you know, if after, are you sexually active? Tell me about your sexual partner, you know, rather than assuming it's a male partner, we ask them, you know, is it men, women, or both? Or let me know who you're sexually active with. Um, same thing goes with, you know, how they ask questions about pregnancy. You know, most medical students are in their 20s, so they're not really thinking about getting pregnant. So they say, are you sexually active? Yes. Are you using birth control? Okay, let's pause. You know, not everyone needs birth control. Why might they not need birth control? So we spend a lot of time talking about the language of the patient history. And then when we begin the physical portion of the exam, we stress the need to let the patient know what you're doing, when you're doing it, talk before touch, um, keeping a flow of conversation going, that silence is awkward. We talk a lot about the power dynamics of the medical setting that even though those med students are nervous because they're new, they are the ones in power when it's time to do the exam and they have to be aware of the power that they have, the vulnerability women have on the table. We talk about the language, you know, instead of spread your knees or spread your legs, let your knees fall to the side. Um, We remind the providers that, one in four women is a victim of sexual violence and you need to be aware that you can't just go in for a, you know, a cervical exam or the bimanual exam. You have to introduce what you're doing. You have to talk through it. Um, that, you know, we want to maintain modesty, but we also don't want, we want eye contact. The woman who's getting the exam <clears throat> usually feels more comfortable if she can see the provider, not if there's a drape, you know, and the provider's hiding under that drape. So a lot of it is really nonverbal communication skills, language choices, um, 
and very strict, repeated, you know, tell, talk before touch. So always tell the patient what you are going to do before you do it. And before you touch them, always say, you will feel my hand on your thigh. You will feel my hand here. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Do you happen to know how recent these kinds of developments are in becoming more patient-centered on the table? Uh, I do. So there's, you know, it goes back to the issue of women's health is always under appreciated under research this has been going on since the late 70s um harvard reached out to the boston women's health collective and they're the folks who wrote the book our bodies ourselves in the late 70s and said can you help us because up until that point when they did practice exams they would practice on they would hire prostitutes They would practice on women who were anesthetized for another reason. You know, maybe they were in there for gallbladder surgery. And while she's on the table asleep, like, let's do a practice exam. Oh, my goodness. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, it's awful. Or female medical students were expected to, you know, do this for their male peers. Um, So that's really what happened for years. And Harvard was the first, at least, recorded school to say we got to find some better practices and that was in 1978 and it is still growing so when we introduced it at University of South Florida which is a research one you know school with a huge medical school that has a cancer center I mean this is a big state university Um, it was about 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009 that we implemented the GTA program. So prior to that, they were paying women to do it, but the women had no voice. They were just literally bodies. Um, So it's only 10 years ago at USF, and I know there are still programs that I think these days most medical schools have some sort of GTA program. But a couple of years ago, there was a um, an ultrasound tech program that was sued here in Orlando because the women were being pressured to practice on each other. And women finally were like, I don't want a transvaginal ultrasound. And I shouldn't have to get one just so that you can practice. And so they sued the school. And they ended up settling. And, and I know this is common in a lot of medical programs. They practice taking blood from each other. They practice other skills on each other. Um, but the well women's exam is a little bit different and a little more private and personal. So it becomes a little bit more of a heightened issue. But from what I, you know, there's no way to find out, like, what does every medical school do this? But in my experience, most do. The level of training of the women who act as GTAs varies immensely. There's no standardized training. Um, if you're interested in learning more, there's a great documentary called At Your Cervix that was put out by, I think, I forget what school, somewhere in San Francisco. And it's all about women who do this. Jessica um, is all ready for her did. first day of class today for the new term. <laughs> so she raised her hand but <laughs> to ask you a question. And of course, you know, you're not here with us in person. <laughs> no, I was signaling to my co-host that I had a follow-up question. But you mm-hmm. actually answered it because as you're talking about the Well Woman exam, I'm getting triggered. Perhaps some of our listeners are being triggered. Um, many of us have been in that situation where the, mm-hmm. I don't want to say it's just men, but the medical students come in, they don't know the simple things like warm up the speculum, that little thing. Mm-hmm. But then the whole touch and the privacy is, it's really mm-hmm. invasive. And yep. so I, what I was going to say is, is there somewhere that women could go if they want to learn more information about this? Maybe their physicians don't practice some of the techniques that you've talked about. How can women learn more? But then you told us about the documentary, which is a great title, by the way. 
Yes, it is a great title. I'm so glad you brought um, that up too, Jessica, because, you know, I always, I always say it's really, really hard to find someone that you're really comfortable with for women's health, you know, and you, mm-hmm. it, it's almost like you meet a lot of providers that you just do not feel comfortable with before you can hopefully find one that you're like, okay, I can, I can handle this person with, with my woman's health, you know? And so I feel like this is a topic that is probably very resonant for, you know, multitudes of women. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think this might be one of the, a case where a younger provider might be better these days because they are getting that training. You know, my fertility doctor is wonderful at fertility, but I regularly would sit there thinking to myself, you are breaking so many rules. Like you should not be doing that. Like you didn't let me know what you were doing or it was like, you're going to feel something cold. And I was like, there was no chance for me to acknowledge that message or receive that message before you stuck that ultrasound inside of me. Um, So I think older practitioners are, you know, reticent to new ideas and are going to be slower, but new wave of medical students coming out, most of them are getting this training. And, and, you know, I don't ever want to put it on the patient, but at this point in my life, I've had so many gynecological exams by so many people at various levels that I have no problem advocating for myself. And when I do, most providers are so surprised that I am and are receptive to the ideas. So, for example, a lot of women who work doing this are midwives, and they recently introduced us to the idea that instead of even using the stirrups or the foot rest, to just pull out the tray and go into like butterfly pose from yoga, it's just as easy to do the exam, um, but it doesn't feel quite as vulnerable because when your feet are on those foot wraps, you feel a little bit trapped and your legs are wide and you're very exposed. But when your feet are together and your knees fall out to the side, you have much more control over your body, not nearly as physically vulnerable, and it doesn't hinder the provider's access whatsoever. The stirrups so, cause so much anxiety. Like I know that my blood so pressure much. instantly goes up as soon as the stirrups come out. Right. So one thing we even try is really, and I made a mistake, Right. But we eliminate the use of the word stirrups. We say foot rest. Because when we think stirrup, we also think horse and like riding and you're like stuck in it. So foot rest is a nicer term. So that's one thing, those simple language shifts that we teach the medical students. But still, I mean, putting your feet in those is a daunting place. It really is. It really, really mm-hmm. is. And, and when you said foot rest, it just occurs to me, my doctor must pl- pa- practice better health care because they said foot rest. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And went about mm-hmm. my business. But yeah, it did sound better than stirrups. Yeah. yeah. In what ways would you encourage people to think differently about infertility, fertility, and women's health um, based on your own research? I mean, women's health is so big, but mostly I would encourage people, women particularly, to advocate for themselves, to not be scared, to ask for what they need. I mean, there's just so many studies that prove, you know, women's health concerns aren't taken as seriously. Um they complain of pain and the doctors don't take them seriously. So a lot of that to me, I encourage people really, you know, find your voice and advocate for yourself. And I say that also knowing it's hard. We still live in a world where a doctor is a powerful person. And when you're naked and vulnerable, it's hard to speak up. Um, in terms of, 
the fertility and infertility, that's really where my research has been going more so lately, again, for personal reasons, um, because my partner is female, it's not infertility, it's fertility, right? Our, but we're seeing an infertility specialist. So I'm curious about how just the whole processes of IVF and are being reshaped now that these aren't necessarily for women who can't get pregnant, but for gay and lesbian couples who want to get pregnant. It changes, right? One is almost a pathology. You can't get pregnant. You must see the specialist. There's something wrong with you. This doctor is here to fix it. Um, I don't want the pathology to carry over to gay and lesbian couples, right? There's something wrong with you. You have a same-sex partner, right? So you must see an infertility doctor. I want to sort of work to shift that language, that these are fertility practices. There's nothing wrong with you. You just need help. Um, and that's, I think, a general practice in health that's trying to eliminate the pathology of a lot of medicine that we take away something being wrong or something being bad. I mean, that's something we even talk about in the well women's exams, right? We're going to frame everything as being healthy and normal. We're not going to, you know, these medical students will come in and be like, I'm just looking to see if I see anything wrong or lesions or diseases on your vagina. And we're like, no, you don't need to say that. All you need to say is everything looks healthy and normal. So getting rid of that negative language and moving towards neutral language, positive, affirming language. And that's, that's where I see myself when I talk about fertility and infertility. That's a really important shift, I think, because, I mean, especially what we see with the housewives is often how taboo they feel it is when they need mm -hmm. to see fertility specialists, right? That there mm -hmm. is a, definitely like a stigma around that with these women. Um, and so shifting this dialogue and perspective about it, I think is also very empowering. Mm-hmm. I agree. And that's one of the things that I'm enjoying with the housewives is more and more of them are talking about fertility practices. And some of them, it is infertility. It is the definition of infertility. They're trying to get pregnant for a certain amount of time. It hasn't been successful. They needed to do these sorts of steps. But even that, we can just eliminate the in part and call it fertility but we do see other women making conscious choices to freeze their eggs preemptively you know I really like the story with Candy Burress and she's using the surrogate right that was a choice she made for her own personal health she has cysts I think on her uterus and she could have surgery and have them removed and then try to get pregnant again, or she could opt for an alternative way of having a child. And she's made that choice. And that's great. It shows her having agency. It shows her making a decision about what's best for her body. Um, and it starts to eliminate the taboo and the stigma of surrogacy, which still has a really bad, I think, cultural conversation surrounding it. You know, there's still this idea that the surrogates steal the babies or, you know, often people still think that when you use a surrogate, it's her eggs. And that's never the case. A surrogate has no biological connection to the baby that they're carrying. So, I love that Candy's using a surrogate and that it's giving the world some information about that topic. 
So the franchise, I mean, have you, as you've just demonstrated, the franchise doesn't shy away from issues regarding fertility and infertility, mm-hmm. right? So we have Candy's storyline. Mm-hmm. We know that Gretchen Rossi and Megan King um, both mm-hmm. um, struggled with pregnancies, juxtaposed to mm-hmm. Heather Debro and Emily Simpson's um, decision about what to do with their embryos. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm always struck by the storyline about Mercedes and Asa and their friendship mm-hmm. and how it kind of dissolved over the fact that Asa wasn't uh, clear and honest about how she became pregnant. At the same time, Mercedes right. was, you know, being very honest about her struggles um, with trying to, to conceive. So, mm-hmm. and, oh, and then we cannot forget, I mean, if you watch Married to Medicine, the most recent yeah. drama is that Jackie, D- Dr. Jackie outed um, Buffy for being infertile. Did did you see this? Right. Are you familiar with this I episode? Saw, I am. I saw the episode, the red happen. I'm not super familiar with the show, but I watched the episode. And I think it was awful. I mean, I think in any situation, like, not only should it, is that seeming to me like a violation of but you don't tell other people secrets and I think it was wrong for her to do that for me I don't I don't for me when I saw it I thought like oh my goodness that's like you take a friend and you just shared with the world that they are you know LGBTQ or something Mm -hmm. if if they Mm -hmm. were not out about that right to me it felt very equivalent of like taking like the most um personal you know, private, you know, things that people should be able to decide when and with who they share. Oh, it it. was an outing. It was, it was, it was was a total outing and, and such a publicly embarrassing way. And to be a medical doctor and to be a medical doctor. I think that violated some, some, some rules. And you could tell that she was devastated and her husband was trying to be like, Oh, it's okay. You know, cause like people are coming to him. It was like the whole thing. Just, I, I, yeah. I could imagine. I can't imagine how traumatizing that was. It was awful. Well, let's pull back a little bit because you know we do chide Bravo a lot Mm -hmm. for some (laughs) things they miss, some things they don't portray. But in your expert opinion, I mean, do you think that they're representing the diversity? Do you think that this is storylines? Not that they're punching up, but they're actually being responsible with. What What do you think about some of the the coverage? I say it like it's a new show. What do you think of some of the coverage? <laughs> no. I mean, it's interesting when you say responsible because I, I don't know if I hold Bravo accountable to be responsible. I don't. I appreciate that they're showing a wide range of situations, right? So I was just rewatching. Um, Shaw's of Sunset before um, and Mercedes is checking her ovulation right now having had done this myself you're supposed to check your ovulation first thing in the morning right she's doing it like willy nilly in the middle of the day so is that careless of Bravo to show that I mean this is a very minor thing um, or is it, you know, that's real life. This is confusing stuff. And here's a well, I mean, she makes a joke. This ovulation is harder than my, you know, taking the bar. Um, so I sort of appreciated that she shows her lack of knowledge about it. Um, I like, I really like some of the hard conversations Emily had about what to do with the embryos, because that is, a real issue for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> I recently learned there's some, you know, anti-choice pro-life organizations that like rally against destroying those embryos and like want to save all the embryos. Um, so, you know, what you do with embryos is a topic a lot of women deal with. Um, you know, I when Tinsley is crying over her eggs in that wedding dress, I mean, <laughs> to me, that was great TV. <laughs> but I also, there was this moment where it didn't, it seemed like she didn't quite understand the difference between that those were eggs, they weren't embryos. 
right, that they still had to be fertilized with somebody's sperm. Um, she didn't seem to quite get that, right? Because she kept talking about her like five babies. And I was like, those aren't, I mean, not that an embryo is a baby, but that's not even a fertilized, you know, you still got a big step to take. There's like an element of like moving the goalpost back even further than just like right. at the point of conception. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that they're showing lots of stories. I thought Megan's vulnerability and willingness to show the details of the process was really fascinating. I mean, she let the cameras in for everything and that was great. Um, and that it was hard for her, you know, and you mentioned Gretchen and Slade. I mean, this has been an ongoing process for them. Mm. You know, I really liked in the scene where Candy went to see about the surrogacy. You know, Todd made a comment, like something along the lines of like, black people don't really do this. And I thought that was a profound moment that... It's true. Like when you see the space of fertility, it tends to be a very white space. So it was great to see, a, you know, a couple of color being represented on Atlanta. Um, Is this perhaps what, because of the cost? Sure. And that was exactly what it was. It is so expensive. It's not covered, you know, the average IVF is going to run you from twenty to fifty thousand dollars. Um, you know, in the same episode with Mercedes, you've got uh, what's his name, the guy who's married, who's married to a man. Forget it. Reza? Her Reza. best friend, Reza. Thank you, Reza, and his husband going to look into it, and they're being quoted one hundred and fifty thousand for the full process with a surrogate. I mean, that's a ton of money, and none of that's covered. Um, and then the baby so, itself is expensive when it's, once it's arrived. Right, right. So it is very cost prohibitive. Um, and obviously that's not addressed much in the housewives because they all seem to have the means to be able to do it. Um, so that's, that's a voice that goes unheard, you know, in terms of representation. But I think just normalizing doing it is fascinating and important. Um, what do I these... Do I re- oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, Please. what do you think all of these various storylines throughout many different um, franchises, seasons th- through the years, what, do the, what does this say about pressures for motherhood and cultural expectations, the expectations women are putting on themselves to be mothers. Any thoughts you have about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it says a lot about how much, uh, you know, that we, that people are willing to spend so much money to have a child. And, um, like, that's, it's still very much, like, that's what it means to be a woman in our culture is to be a mother. Um, And I think a lot of these shows do give voice to that, that when these processes don't work, these women feel like failures. Now I really appreciate it. And I'm not super familiar with the storyline, but I watched some of it on, um, was it millionaire listings, right? When Frederick and his husband we're trying to have a baby and it didn't work two or three times. I think they implanted an embryo in a surrogate and the embryo didn't take. So I, I appreciate that you see another identity, another voice, right? These are two men who are saddened by the loss of not being able to have a child, which is great to see that, you know, I'm sad for him. But to see a diversity of people wanting to start families and not being able to is, you know, representation is important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, how do we I'm transition to from that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I go ahead. Are you ready to play our game break? Sure. That sounds great. So now we're going to go into our Bonko Party game break. Ooh. Yay! And today's game I am calling Cheeseburger in Paradise. Okay. <laughs> um, we have some listeners who really prefer collective community games rather than games where uh, it's more trivia based and you got to know it to get points and compete. So um, to for today, it's going to be one of these collective decide by committee games. Okay. Oh, just kind of. You have to repeat that. Oh, wonderful. That's how I do best. <laughs> <laughs> so I have paired, there's there's three rounds, and I have paired various vacations with the food. And okay. your job as our expert panel um, is to come to consensus on which vacation and which food you would rather be enjoying. Does this make sense? Okay. Okay, mm-hmm. so first up, would our panel prefer Luann's Eggs a la Francaise in Turks and Caicos? <laughs> or would you prefer to eat gummy bears with Kelly Ben Simone on Scary Island? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, God. I feel like gummies with Kelly, I'm taking my life into my own hands. <laughs> Agreed. At that moment, but I don't really want Luann's leaky eggs either. <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like she would yell exactly. at you the whole time that you ate your eggs a la Frances, like because you weren't like enjoying them enough or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think right. we're looking at this wrong. We're looking at the actual dish. We need to look at the surroundings. I would rather be in Turks and Caicos. Wait, yeah. Where was... Kelly Benson. Was I'm it she also? Island? Was she also in Turks and Caicos? I think it was Turks and Caicos, wasn't it? I'd also just rather be with Luann than Kelly. Yeah. I mean, Luann fascinates me. Kelly just frightens me. Uh, I'd take her leaky eggs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. He no was the intended. Scary yeah. Island was the Virgin Islands. Okay. Oh, so right. it's like Virgin Islands or Turks and Caicos. Turks and Caicos with leaky Turks eggs. Turks and Caicos, yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, sure. I mean, Turks Scary Island Ca- is iconic, but again... You're talking about a vacation, though. Which, <laughs> I mean, I don't... I teachers mean, don't normally do you, get. I mean... <laughs> right, so that's why we can't answer this question. I, I don't know. <laughs> For me, I'm like, do I would I rather have Kelly or would I rather have Heather? I was oh. not a, I was not a Hala fan. Like I, uh, Heather, Heather, oh, all Heather got be- under my skin a lot. First of all, yummy tummy is revolutionary for everyone. <laughs> and even though Heather misappropriated some of some of culturalisms from the Afro Americans, I say it the way Malcolm X would say it, Afro Americans. Um, she, in some ways, I could see how she could be offensive to people. I, I didn't mind her. I didn't mind her. I mean, I felt sorry for her little, um, what is her little cabin that isn't quite the Berkshires? That everyone shamed her about, but I didn't oh, yeah. mind Heather. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mind Heather. Are you guys going to Turks and Caicos? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, Turks and Caicos. Lots of eggs, all the Frances. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if Luann knows how to make other things, so you might get bored. But <laughs> Bethany yeah. was there too, so you could get what, a lot of salad. What are eggs, all the Frances? Or because it came off to me like she <laughs> anything she makes up. <laughs> yeah, like. She just made scrambled eggs and called them eggs all the front. <laughs> like runny scrambled eggs. Yeah. <laughs> right, with some parsley maybe chopped on top. Eggs a la Giovanni. But you'll you'll be you'll be very cool. You won't be uncool. Right. Be very cool. Don't be uncool. <laughs> okay. Next up. Would you rather have the Thai street food with the ladies of Dallas? Mm-hmm. Or would you prefer In N Out at Miraval with the Trace Amigas? Oh 
as you know, Vicky does not eat fast food. And Emily Simpson has recently trolled Vicky hard on Twitter because Vicky's like, well, I don't eat fast food. And cut to Emily dropping clips of her arriving at Maribel with in and out <laughs> So, like, no matter what I do, I'm miserable. Because, like, if I go to Thailand, uh, I'm going to get food poisoning if I'm eating Thai street. There's no way my stomach is going to hold up. For those of you that don't know how Max travels, like anything that smells good, he is in line. It's in his mouth. He <laughs> will, you, will, you, will actually, mouth. <laughs> you will actually lose him because yeah. he goes from one street car vendor to the next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My kind of travel. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the other side, like, so I know I'm not going to get uh, food poisoning if I eat it in and out, but like I have to eat it with the Trace Amigas in Arizona. It, yeah. No, there's anything wrong with Arizona for listeners in Arizona. Yeah. But <laughs> hey, but we I want to go there at some point. I know, but you know, my skin always dries out really, really bad every time I go to Arizona. <laughs> I love the dry heat of the West. I mean, what? I love it. I mean, I, I was I, raised in it. I, I mean, I love it. My face peels in like an hour. I'm saying Trace Amigas, though, right? I'm saying. Mm, that's a hard one. In and out, I'm not eating beef, so I would have to go and have, even though I'm not eating beef, the number one combo with, with the hamburger, the fries, and substitute for the shake. Thai street food, I'm not really a street food person, but I love Thai food. But I'd have to go with the Dallas women that everyone loves and everyone's into, and I'm still on, maybe I need another season. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. What are we going to do? Yeah. Rachel, what are we going to do? No. I'm I'm also torn because I would I would eat the street food and I would love to go and eat it in Thailand, but you know I, I, again it sort of comes back to like Vicky and Tamra. I feel like they're family. Like I've been watching them on TV for so long that to just be with them in real life would be something special. Would that be like having to spend time, though, with the relatives that you really hate seeing at the holidays, but you have to see them like that one time a year? No, she's talking about <laughs> way more lovingly. Like, she's talking no, about... No, I really, like, would just... I mean, Dickie is so crazy. I don't have that love for the Dallas women yet. Like, I like the show and I watch it, but I, I don't feel connected to the women on that show. The, you know, Dickie and I go way back. Yeah, and I always want an escape plan. It's going to be easier to get home from yeah. Arizona than it is Thailand. An easy yeah. Southwest flight. Easy, easy. Right. Southwest, true. we don't charge uh, rebooking fees. <laughs> Although, right. Shannon will probably talk to you about David a lot. Oh, God. Yeah, I finally, this season, have hit my breaking point with Shannon. It's like, girlfriend, you've got oh, to move God. on. I mean, you're 40 pounds oh. lighter. Move on. And you but don't I, mean to tell us how good you're doing. We get it. You're great. I would want to be there for the the hitting the bong over the head incident because I had opinions. So <laughs> and I'm so earthy and crunchy. Yes, bring please bring in and out to a retreat where I'm supposed to be healthy and being one Detoxing. with nature. Yes. Please, that's my kind of party. Mm-hmm. Final answer. Right. Arizona. Yeah. yeah. Arizona. Arizona. Okay. Our last round. I think it's my favorite round. Would you rather go to Hawaii with Maurizio? The food at this point is not going to matter because I think it's <laughs> not about the food. It's not about the pasta. Um, <laughs> you'll probably not realize how much continental hotel food you're having, but everything will taste great. Um, or, <laughs> or would you like to eat sushi in Tokyo with the Roa ladies. Candy really was not feeling all the sushi like a couple days in. So there's going to be plenty of excess sushi. I'm going Maurizio all the way. <laughs> okay. I can get pokey in Hawaii. Like <laughs> It's raw. It's fine. <laughs> We're going to be split on this because as much as I like Maurizio, I, to our listeners in Hawaii, I maybe because I went, Oh no, my family listens to this too. Maybe because I went on family trips to Hawaii, I'm I'm underwhelmed. So again, uh, I would have to go with the Atlanta Housewives. I mean, because who wouldn't? I'm I mean, with you and the Atlanta Housewives and all the extra sushi that they're not eating. Yeah, fine, whatever. Mauricio's the life of the party. <laughs> But oh, he, yeah. he was this last yeah. trip to Hawaii. Like, yeah. what are you on, Maurizio? I need to know. <laughs> I 
That was amazing. That was so funny. But I definitely had a lot of munchies. Yeah. (laughs) Fine, fine. We'll go to Atlanta. Or uh, uh, Japan. Yeah, yeah, Tokyo with uh, the ladies of Atlanta. But I'm going as a hostage a little bit. But wait, was that the epic one where Eva read um, Yes, the most most epic bus Mm -hmm. read of all time. Wouldn't miss it for the world. That's true. Big (laughs) mini breakdown. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Oh, so good. Yeah, it was Camille? Camille was in Hawaii. Yeah, okay. It was her wedding. It was, right? it was Camille's yeah. wedding. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's honestly, I think, why Maurizio also had to <laughs> imbibe a little bit. Yeah, right. Because it was well, medicinal. <laughs> he was making he was Necessary. making all of the buffets better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, well, that concludes our Bonco Party game break. Everybody is a big winner today. Okay, so back to the questions. Mm-hmm. So, Dr. Jackie from Married to Medicine has been very open mm-hmm. about her own infertility. And we Mm -hmm. talked a little bit already about how she's outed Buffy um, and Buffy's struggle um, with infertility. Um, Could you help us reflect a little bit more on this moment and maybe even more with Candy and surrogacy and talk about the race and class and age pressures surrounding women's reproduction? Sure. Um, So I want to say, you know, I, I do think, that Karen was wrong. Karen Huger? Sorry, not Karen. Well, I, Dr. Jackie. Yeah. I don't know why I said Karen. Sorry, Dr. Jackie. That's okay. Because I don't, I'm not so familiar with that show. Her outing Buffy was not okay. Like, I fundamentally believe that. At the same time, you know, it, it's sad to see I think a lot of Buffy's sadness was the shame that she feels for being infertile. Mm -hmm. And that, that stigma is something that I'd like to see removed, right? That there shouldn't be any shame in doing this. You know, I mean, a lot of women are infertile because they led full lives prior to wanting children. And, you know, our bodies are meant to reproduce at like 16, 17 years old. They're not meant to reproduce at 40. So there's nothing shameful about waiting till you're 40. You had other things to do. Like where our bodies do and what our society asks of us are two very different things. Um, and, but that shame of your body failing needs to go. And so I wish Buffy didn't feel so sad by being outed. And I think she wouldn't if there wasn't so much shame around these sense of infertility and fertility practices. Um, But in terms of your bigger question, you know, as we said, class is an issue. This stuff is not covered under health insurance. It's all out of pocket and it's astronomical, you know, the cost of doing IVF. Um, I have friends who have traveled out of the country, you know, IVF and fertility is becoming a new form of medical tourism, going to places like Czech Republic because it's cheaper there and doing IVF there. You know, there have been stories of people finding surrogates um, in developing nations because it's cheaper to pay those women, you know, and there's obviously a lot of complications with that. I also find it interesting, you know, outside of the U.S., I have a friend who's French. The French government will pay to freeze your eggs because to them it's about, you know, they have the declining population. They want more French citizens. And if you want to freeze your eggs, they'll help you. And I've seen a couple of years ago there were some stories about different tech companies in Silicon Valley that were offering women egg freezing as a signing bonus with the understanding that when our bodies are most fertile is also when we are most economically productive. So it's great to get pregnant when you're 20, but most of us want careers when we're in our 20s. 
So well, and after two thousand and eight, it's been very difficult. I think for people in their twenties to, mm-hmm. you know, create, you know, start families. It's been very cost prohibitive since right since the crash. So the issue of class is just, I mean, it it, it exists. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know what there is to say about it. Fertility is, is not accessible, you know, or you go into a ton of debt. Um, in terms of race, you know, I'm glad to see it being discussed on these TV shows. Uh, the project I'm working on, looking at queer and lesbian couples, um, who are embarked on this. I have a number of interracial couples that I'm talking to, but it, it's still, I think, a minor, I mean, you just don't, fertility still appears to be a very white practice and phenomenon. Um, but obviously, I can't imagine there's any medicine that would show white women are any more infertile than of women of color. I mean, that's absurd, but we just don't see that, you know, and it, and it brings up all, all the issues of sort of the privilege of whiteness, right? That it becomes the invisible identity. It's the normal identity that fertility is something white people do. It's normal for them and everybody else becomes an exception and that's problematic. So I'm glad to see some new people bringing their identities to the topic. Um, I do think it's important, you know, most of what we see on the housewives, I guess, is, is women who are considered advanced maternal age, right? So 35 plus you are, your fertility significantly declines after 35. And I, I don't think we've seen anyone on the housewives younger than 35 embarking on fertility practices. So we're not really, the issue of age, again, is what it is. Um, There are women who are younger that struggle with fertility, but we know biologically it gets harder as you get older, and that's most of what we are seeing on the housewives and other Bravo shows. One of the things that strikes me with Gretchen Rossi changing gears slightly mm-hmm. is that she has brought attention to postpartum depression since mm-hmm. having her daughter Skylar. Mm-hmm. Um, can you we talk briefly about PPD? Um, do you think that PPD is potentially as misunderstood as IUI and infertility? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think almost everything when it comes to women's health is misunderstood. You know, I I mean, anything with fertility, pregnancy is, there's a lack of research. It's misunderstood because there's a lack of research, you know, so a study that was done years ago is still what people are referring to. And we're 40 years later, society has changed, but we're still using these archaic studies about postpartum. You know, I mean, I think it, it speaks to our current climate, you know, Michelle Williams, the golden globe standing up there telling women they need to vote for their own best interest because men have been doing that for years. I mean, I think that's exactly what happens in women's health is that it's not taken seriously. And that's, Everything with fertility, with motherhood. I mean, it's even, you know, like the commercial commercialization of breast cancer. Breast cancer is a horrible disease that kills women, but it's not the biggest cancer killer for women. It's not the biggest disease that kills women, but it gets the most attention because people love boobs and pink. And it's a great way to like sell a product, but. It's not going where the money is not really going where it needs to go. And there's way bigger issues for women than breast cancer. Um, But breast cancer is fun to talk about because people love boobs. And I think that that's 
sort of trivialization of women's health just is across the board. So postpartum's not taken seriously. Um, Infertility is not taken seriously, or if it is, it's often, oh, well, you waited too long. It's your own fault. You can't get pregnant, you know, but then <laughs> MTV makes an entire series about teen moms where we poke fun at women who got pregnant too young. So it's just more of a situation where women can't do anything right. Their bodies are always failing. Their choices are wrong. It strikes me that in some of some of what you're – you've talked to us about is this transition that you've been actively working on from like a vessel like treatment of women and their, Mm -hmm. and their women's health to this patient centered dynamic. Right. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, being a pregnant woman right now, it's definitely Mm -hmm. something that I encounter almost every single day where people treat me like I'm like literally a vessel and not a person, (laughs) you know, and I, I can imagine that part of what's happening with PPD is that, you know, the the mother is still ignored, like the medical needs, yeah. right? It, it beca- It's like now, you know, it was about the baby before the baby was born, and now it's mm-hmm. like extra about the baby now that it's here, right? And so you have this mm-hmm. patient that no one is actually paying attention to. Right. Absolutely. Right. Women are, I mean, you know, that's often to me the, debate about abortion like a lot of times women are getting abortions because they're at risk and you have these politicians who are like I don't care about the woman save the baby like the woman's body is irrelevant in so many ways right and I think postpartum is exactly another example of that and it again goes back to this like oh it's just your hormones like because you're too emotional I mean, and you can find roots of this, of like women being hysterical. I mean, this is nothing new. This just pathologization, I can never say that word. Pathologizing. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Of women and their bodies. Well, I also think, I mean, I think you hit, hit the nail on the head when you talked about the commercialization, right? It's it's more mm-hmm. fun to say save the tatas. Um, shout out to my sister; right. she's a radiology ology tech for for screening for breast cancer. But it's much more fun. It's it's more sellable, and in some ways, that's you know we're talking about TV. That's also the storyline, right? No one mm-hmm. wants to be sad. No one wants to be right. sad. Um, trust me. I mean, Max and I both work on slavery. We know that these are not dinner party conversations. No one. Right. No one want, it, it's hard to sell that kind of product. And um, I think your comment is very valid that there are so many other health concerns that we need to pay attention to as it comes to women. So I, I want to thank you for those observations. Um, so I have the task of bringing us back to um, a lighter subject or not, mm-hmm. question mark, <laughs> or not. <laughs> So you have spent an incredible amount of time thinking and writing about The Real Housewives as you were the editor of this Mm -hmm. wonderful volume, The Fantasy of Reality, Critical Essays on The Real Housewives, published in 2015. So Mm -hmm. in your introduction, you said that this was radical television. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on why you feel that way? Um, And kind of in light of what we've talked about today, do you consider it still radical? Do you consider it to be feminist television? I do consider it to be feminist television, you know, it, that is, labeling things as feminist or people say it's always tricky, but I see it as that. I think giving women voices is giving them equality and that's what feminism is. It's gender equality. So even if I don't agree with their voices or like their voices, we're giving them equal opportunity to have voices. Um, I like that these shows focus on women's lives. I like about their friendships. Um, one of the things that I also talk about in the introduction is that these sort of are a new version of soap operas. And the soap opera was always seen as women's television, like the romance novel, and they were belittled forms of media. But the soap opera tackled complex social issues 
long before other television shows did. I mean, I remember 30 years ago watching General Hospital. and We had a character who was HIV positive. I mean, oh, yes. you never saw people. Right. I mean, they as trivialized as it may have been at times, like women on those shows were being raped regularly Mm -hmm. and that we were talking about it. And so to me, this is very much the feminist notion that the personal political. And I, one of the things that I like, I see this as sort of a mediated consciousness raising, right? I know that representation isn't enough. It's a great start, you know, to see new people and new ideas on television. There's more that needs to be done. But when these very intimate issues that are undiscussed and are considered shameful, like rape, like HIV, like infertility, when we see them on television, they're less and they're not invisible anymore, I think we start to make them also less shameful. People see this stuff on TV and they're like, Oh look, she's also struggling with what to do with her embryos. You know, I'm not alone in this. And so I do see these as feminist texts. I think they still are incredibly powerful. I mean, I don't know if they're as revolutionary as they were five, 10 years ago, but I, I don't, I, you know, maybe that's just because they've been around for longer now, but I think they continue to do the work of bringing new ideas out of the shadows and into discussion. And that is revolutionary and important. And I value the shows for that. What do you um, see as changing um, between, t- say, 10 years ago and the way that? Uh, Housewife shows are produced now? Um, well, I think the women are much more vulnerable in, well, you know, it's tough because I also know that, you know, they want to be recast season after season. Like this is their living at some point. And so being vulnerable is also being profitable, right? Like they know how to be cast members. I thought Vicky tapped into that sort of, you know, in the reunion, when she's like, this is my show. and We need to talk about how we act. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Right, that was hilarious. Which is, like, <laughs> that was amazing. If you could ever but look I, up black kettles right, in the I mean, dictionary. <laughs> you know, like, I have noticed a lot more of the women do want to protect their friendships, right? Early on, I think there was just a lot of fighting and the fighting made good TV and they were happy to throw each other on the bus and say nasty things and disparage each other and just walk off and be like, yep, I did that. But more and more, there is this, you know, talking about sisterhood and female empowerment and some of it, you know, catchphrases, but I do think that there's a lot of women on these housewife shows who are using this as a way to show how valuable female friendships are and that women do need to support each other. And they do keep going back to that. And yes, they cause drama and they fight and all that as well, because that makes good TV. But they continuously circle back to friendships and empowerment and supporting each other. And I don't think that, I don't remember that happening 10 years ago on these shows. They were just in it to make a buck and to make good TV. So now this brings us to our Bravo News update. (laughs) Okay, so um, admit uh, in the middle of this, supposed horrible lawsuit with Jim Bellino that Tamara's in. Mm-hmm. Um, she has gone out and bought herself a very expensive Range Rover. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? Mm. You know, because she's complaining that Kelly's lost her all this money by getting involved, but, you know, allegedly Tamara's insurance said months ago they weren't covering any of her lawsuit because 
she was speaking at a turn. So she went after the insurance company too. Still not sure how that's playing out. Last I read, the insurance company was refusing to pay Tamara. Um, but somehow she hasn't lost enough money to prevent her from getting her new Range Rover. <laughs> Realizing that all of my stories today come from Southern California and other news. <laughs> <laughs> Real Housewives of Orange County contracts were just delivered on January 6th. Oh. Bum, 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 bum. So, um, or they were, they were supposed to be delivered. And I believe that executives were all the way down to the wire arguing over whether or not to cut the Trace Amigas or keep them and cut everybody else. So mm. it is really still up in the air about who they cut and who they kept, but they weren't necessarily sure or tied to keeping any single one of the Orange County wives. Where do you come down on this, Rachel? On the Trace Amigas? Yeah. Or, or like the revamping would, of Orange County, like who would you keep, who would you cut? I would be happy to cut Vicky. I was really happy to see her. I, I'll be honest, like I watch the shows, but I, I don't follow them on Twitter and I don't keep up behind the scenes a lot. So like, I mean, she was demoted to friend opposed to cast member, right? She didn't have her tagline at the beginning, but she didn't seem to think she'd been demoted to friend. Um, I'm happy to have her demoted. I love Tamara. Shannon. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I oh, it's so hard. I feel I like Tamara you know, get- hiding in a bush has been my favorite <laughs> Tamara scene I've ever, I've ever, ever so That's hilarious. hilarious. That's it was hilarious. So good. And it was such a Homer Simpson moment, you know, the, right. the gif that goes around where Homer just disappears into the bush. Right. I, I laughed so hard. Um, I loved Bronwyn. I thought she was a great addition to the cast. I really liked Gina. I wouldn't mind seeing Kelly leave. You at know, all. I wouldn't mind it at all. I'm sorry, this is you about know, you, but I wouldn't mind it at no. all. <laughs> Thank you. I always debate with a friend of mine. She's like, "No, Kelly, you know, makes good TV," and I'm just like, "I, I don't know what she does. Kelly could leave." I feel like Kelly would do really well in New York City. Yeah, maybe they talked about it at BravoCon. I just that's feel like thing. she has, is. She, mm-hmm. she is very up in your face. She doesn't back down. I feel like she could really hold her own with eggs a la Frances. And, uh, you know, she's like really good friends with Ramona. I believe Dorinda is supposed to officiate her wedding. So I just, I almost feel like she has <laughs> the right kind of edge to go toe to toe with these New York women, especially when they go to the Berserkshires. And yeah, I mean, not to harp on the representation point too much, but like, it would be nice if like a person of color was on New York City, like just one. Well, I th- sure I right. agree with you. Um, we've talked a bit on the podcast yeah. about Kelly, and because she's Latina, and maybe some of these attacks are more racially motivated in the way they wouldn't be for other um, cast members. I, I I would only offer though. Mm, no, I'm not going to step in it. We've had a great, we've had a great <laughs> podcast. It sounds great. Go to New York, <laughs> diversify just enough. I don't um, want to get texts from Max at like I don't eleven get o'clock at night. From Max saying we got to edit this. We're going to be sued, <laughs> though we have no money. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just recuse myself. From so the we can't talk about Leanne's racism. Oh yeah, let's I talk mean, about all the all, all the day. time. All the flipping time. No, I would be texting her about like why Kelly is essential for Real Housewives of Orange County and she just doesn't want to have to listen to it. I mean, I'm good and as someone who screeches when they get excited or they're upset, I'm just like, enough with the screeching man. Bring it down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk as an intelligible like person, not intelligent, intelligible person, so I can hear what you're saying. But all this does, she protests way too much. Quit yeah. screaming and bring it down. I mean, I never thought someone could out scream like Ramona, like, and how Ramona talks really fast and like everything. But Kelly just, maybe she can go to a show that I don't watch as much. And I watch mm-hmm. New York, so maybe she needs to go to another show. <laughs> but it would be more interesting with her on New York. Let I also wonder up. if she would be less defensive on New York. 
Well, yeah, because they also have real money. Well, and I think that <laughs> I think I think she actually has real friendships with the New York. Women. Right, right. As opposed to being in Orange County, and I don't think any of her friendships were ever really that genuine. Agreed. But yeah. I Agreed. will say that I was very impressed that Bronwyn did not out whichever child came mm-hmm. out after watching the season and being able to talk to their parents about, um, you know, their sex practices. Definitely pleased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because she, like, really wants to be on the show, too. So it's good that she yeah. didn't. Like, I, I was, I was, I was really, like, I'm, I was more. really happy that she did not out her child. <laughs> She did a decent act. I mean, because I mean, but I mean, you kind yeah. of expect a housewife just yeah. lay it all out on the table, and I, you know, and in that moment, she was very conscious of this mm-hmm. is my child's story to tell when, when, and if they're ready to share that mm-hmm. on this public platform. So, I, I did like that. Right, and I, you know, going back to some of the stuff I said earlier, I think that what these shows can do even in Bronwyn being honest about her you know bisexuality if that's what I don't know if she identifies that way but her desire for women helping her child to come out right that's the sort of personal political that I think these shows do offer and I think those voices are important yeah agree. Mm-hmm. our last story from Southern California. Jessica mm-hmm. actually um, was texting about it to us the other day. Of course, there's a car that crashed in pump. Into the pump restaurant. Into the pump right. restaurant. Lisa Vanderpump's oh. pump. And, you know, the interesting thing is um, Jessica and I um, were both Bruins at UCLA. And I will tell mm-hmm. you that it's like it's hard to go down that strip in West Hollywood. I mean, I feel like there's at least one car in a restaurant a week probably yeah. more <laughs> it's, it's all the time let's be clear the car was what a ferrari so it's not yeah. just a car yeah no there is like a high-end <laughs> vehicle goes through a, a window all the time but my 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 own shady boot moment if i if i can i was at least impressed that this time the insurance payout is not from a suspect grease fire Ooh. boom roasted <laughs> sound effect uh which uh i mean <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the ooh anymore. That was replaced oh. by the Vicky tab. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that that's our Bravo news well, for today. Excellent. That was good news. Thank you. Why is yeah. why why do cars tend to go through storefronts in West Hollywood more than <laughs> other places? <laughs> I have a few theories. One, I think I think that there I mean obviously there's like the drunk driving aspect. Mm-hmm. Two, I think that there's a lot of like do you see that person on the sidewalk and then you veer? Like, you uh, kind of it's tried, Tom Hanks! You kind of like veer into where you're going. Um, three, I think that it's gotten more common too with the whole like texting, driving, smart car thing where you're like pressing buttons and like really multitasking. Oh, and there's just like a more, con- there's a higher concentration of those. And that there. particular corner at, um, is that it was that Robertson in Santa Monica? Mm-hmm. It's it's like an incredibly busy intersection. Right. And then are we on five or six? Five, six. And come on, man! I'm in a Ferrari. My car can go faster than yours. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's road rage. Then so you're much fast road rage. Car and, and yes, so much road rage. So all of the above. Hmm. It's just a phenomenon. <laughs> so when in WeHo, keep, keep your careful. eyes open. <laughs> yeah, no. You, it, when in WeHo. My my safety advice is always like sit at the back of the restaurant. Sit at the back of the restaurant. Don't be by the window. <laughs> That's too funny. Okay, so Rachel, what is yes. next for you? What do you want people to know about your upcoming work, and how can they get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Um. So my upcoming work is really the beginnings of what I hope to be a book project about what I'm tentatively titling queering fertility. And it's going to be looking at LGBTQ couples fertility practices. Um, so, and fertility by engaging with fertility doctors and the medical field. So, um, so that's where I'm going these days. And that's, 
going to be quite a long project, I think. Um, and I'm excited for that. You know, I'm also including my own story because I didn't realize, Casey, I'm also pregnant at the moment. So congratulations. I have. Thank you. <laughs> a long and also expensive process. Um, but I'm interested really in this sort of as a ethnographic and autoethnographic project about fertility um, and changing the way that we talk about it. In terms of getting in touch with me, I'm bad with social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. My university webpage would work. Email, I'm always happy to get emails. Rachel E. Silverman at gmail.com. Um, but I'm still not on Twitter. I feel like I have to whisper that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I have an account, but I don't actually ever get on it. So that's where I'm going with my work these days. And, you know, very excited about Vanderpump Rules starting up again. Um, we saw the first episode of BravoCon. They showed it. It oh. is a masterpiece. It's really good. It's like... I can't wait. Yeah. It was... I can't wait. They... they the entire... Uh, I don't know if you've been to the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York, but, like, mm -mm. it was... Compl it's this big amphitheater. Um, if you've seen the movie Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, mm -hmm. that's the theater that Kevin is watching opera in, I believe. Anyway, it was, like, floor to ceiling. People were in chairs watching. It was probably the most pump rules fans in one place watching an yeah. episode that mm -hmm. I think is going to go down in history as like one of the oh. best. I mean, it's up there with like season two of pump rules, right. not quite Stassi hitting Kristen, but like <laughs> in the general area. Right. Well, good. I'm really excited. And I'm also really excited for the second reunion of Dallas. Yeah, me too. I'm very invested in them this season and curious to see what they do with Leanne. Apparent, uh, Andy intimated that they were like going to do, an, I think, an entire episode of the reunion covering like Thailand Leanne. and right. Leanne. Mm -hmm. As they should. You know, her comments are not okay. And I'm really be held accountable. I'm really interested to see what producers do, not just with Leanne, about her horrible, horrible, horrible racism this season. Yeah. But also, Vicky was so transphobic and homophobic. Yep. Extremely. And, I mean, yep. the Orange County women have been for a long time, but it was so on blast with Vicky this year. Yep that I just can't wrap my head around how anyone could justify that continued contract presence. Um, Agreed completely. It was, it was, those were those two women in particular were really tough watches this year. Mm -hmm. well, going back to the housewives of Dallas. I don't know if anyone saw this, but something came out recently with Brandy Redman saying doing a very it was a video from 2017 yeah. that she did on like like Instagram or something like that and then she took it down right away and it was because the cast had been telling her that she had squinty eyes when mm -hmm. she's like drunk and so she made her own squinty eye video and then oh. took it down shortly after posting it years ago now like three brackets, years ago brackets on Jessica sips tea and rolls her eyes yeah yeah Yes, um, definitely. And so, and so she's, you know, she said she defended it up until very recently. Well, and the, you know, she said that she apologized for it when she did it and took it down immediately. And now she's defending it, but apologizing for it again. But it's, you know, it's this, it's this moment where I'm just like, okay. We got to have some serious conversations with this cast because it's, I think, very clear that no one would have told Carrie because I don't think that they thought it was going to air. So they were all, I, I feel like so many of, I think almost all of them were willing to just be very accepting mm -hmm. of, of these behaviors. 
And then it was mm-hmm. like, and then it's like they realized it was going to get caught and it was going to come out. So they had to do something. Mm. Right. And I think the same is true of the way Vicky talks. You know, they sort of just ignore it. Nobody wants to make a claim about her homophobia. You know. Yeah, no one wants to be in a fight with, with her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I hope Andy calls them out. If nothing else, but it's concerning. Yeah, I agree with you. Jessica's going to need more tea and eye rolls over <laughs> over this one. Her eyes got stuck. I mean, I just, I, my eyes got stuck, and I just thought about, I mean, how do you resolve it? It's good television, but it's so not cool. It's so uncool, and we shouldn't be dealing with this still in 2020, but it's also. It's also that lens through which you're seeing yes. the society around you. Yes. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, and where it's just that much more obvious that society really hasn't moved that far. Exactly. That's what I'm stunned about because there are segments of the society that think some of this is okay and champion it. And you don't make this video unless you also think it's okay. So it's just, right. I mean, it becomes and like for me. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. I say for me, it's not even just Leanne's racist comments about Carrie being Mexican, but then the doubling down where she's like, some Mexicans are my best friends. Mm-hmm. Latin lovers are the best. I would just, everybody I mean, and didn't she say at one point like everybody uses chirpy Mexican where we are? You know, like it was like yeah. some right. comment like that's made, and I was like, that doesn't make it any less terrible. It's so gross, right? It's just, I mean, it, it, it's the doubling down on the racism. I think that really was troublesome for me. You know, like mm-hmm. next, I just need Vicky to be like, oh no, I love trans people are good friends of mine. Like, it doesn't make it okay. Right. Instead, it's like making these people in their lives tokens to right. know, excuse their behaviors. I think right. if we broke down each franchise, this will be saved for another episode sometime in the future. But, like, <laughs> a lot of people on these shows would have to go in for, like, HR oh, meetings. Oh, absolutely. This oh, is yeah. an yeah. HR nightmare. I don't know if anyone would escape HR. Not on these shows, no. Yeah. Mm-mm. 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 Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. And we're so happy that you could speak to us. And this was a fantastic conversation, Rachel. Yes. Thank you so much for for having me. Thank you for giving us your time. It was great. Oh, my pleasure. I, I really enjoyed doing this. You know, I love talking about Bravo. So it's nice to do it with other people who love the shows. And yeah, I wouldn't be happier. Wait a afternoon. Please feel free to come back whenever you'd like. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you, you too. Thank Bye. You. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Historians on Housewives. As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com where you can propose your own episode topic, ask us questions, and send us feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Historians H. And don't forget that you can like and review the podcast on your podcast platform. Thank you, Rachel Silverman. This show is brought to you with the support by Barbara and Mark Spear, Saddleback Community College, Christina Hinkle, Christina Gampapur, Jed Merlaski, Pete Murray, Yvonne Bellardes, Cody Baker, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, Lara Loper, Kim Bettendorf, and Luis Asio de Dios. And remember, scholars do bravo too. Okay. Are we still recording? Yeah. <laughs> Is that going to be the.